Welcome to Hot Talk India and the second of three interviews with top leaders of the three parties contending these elections. Today we talk to the man that many consider the likely choice for Prime Minister if the Congress party is in a position to form the next government. So what are his political values and how does he view the present state of affairs in India? Here to answer those questions is former Finance Minister and the present leader of the opposition in the Rajya Sabha, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Dr. Singh, after eight years in the Rajya Sabha, you decided to stand for the Lok Sabha, something you consciously didn't do in 96 and you didn't do in 98. What's brought about the change of mind this time? Well, I was initially very reluctant to contest this time also. But our party felt that in the interest of the party and in the, and in the interest of our country, uh, it will be good if I offered myself for election. Although I have been a member of the Rajya Sabha, I do believe uh, that the quality of membership uh, that goes with the membership of the Lok Sabha is superior because you are elected directly by the people. Therefore, I was, though I was initially reluctant, I think when I thought it over, I thought I have been in politics now for eight, nine years. I should go to the people to pronounce their verdict on what I am, what I have been, and what uh, uh, vision, what views I hold. So in a sense, you're actually now seeking a mandate for the views you hold. That's true. Do you think, however, that you're suited to this sort of electoral politics? Well, uh, I had initial doubts, but uh, I'm learning very fast. And in the last five or six days that I go campaigning every morning, every evening, I am finding it a very educative experience. Let me put something to you that people say. Your admirers say that in stepping into the Lok Sabha arena, Dr. Manmohan Singh may be in danger of losing the one thing that made him different. Earlier he was above politics. Today, in a sense, he's becoming a bit like any other politician. Well, uh, I am in politics and I don't claim any special virtues. Uh, all I can say is that uh, in politics, I have learned that one has to compromise, but there is a limit to compromise. And if you compromise at the cost of your conscience, I think there should, you should draw the line. And whether I am in Rajya Sabha or in Lok Sabha, I hope I will have the moral courage to not cross that line. And, that, Sorry. and that line is set by my own conscience. So will you still be able to do some of the things the country admired? Speak out when you think the time has come. Stand up for the views that you believe were correct allow your voice to be heard in favor of the causes you've always supported? I do believe uh, we need a new type of politics. A politics of frankness, a politics which tells the people the things, the straight things as they are. I think we cannot I, be fool our people. You may, as Abraham Lincoln once said, you can fool some people for all time, all people for some time, but not all people for all time. And I do believe that in the last 50 years, I think politicians have been taking our people for a ride and I feel there is a great danger if the gap between what politicians say, promise and what they do, I think grows the way it has been growing. Okay, let's test that a little, Dr. Saab, because I think in the seeds of that perhaps lie some of the hopes for our country. Many people in India today feel a sense of alienation, a sense of disenchantment with Indian politics, Indian politicians. As a new man stepping into the Lok Sabha arena, can you understand that? I do very much understand that uh, politics in this country has to be the servant of social sympathies. It has to mediate uh, among societal tensions which are built into the body politic of a poor country trying to modernize itself. And you can do so only if people believe in your credentials. And if you are telling things and you have no intentions of doing that, I think you are now trading on trust and you cannot last very long, I think. People become cynical, alienated, as you put it. As you say, telling the truth, even if it's the bitter truth, is very important. And one of the fears that people in India have is they look at our quarreling politicians, our hung parliaments, our divisions of race, creed, religion, language, is that we could face, if things aren't handled properly, disintegration. We could be poised at the brink of anarchy. Well, I have always felt that if you read my speeches in Parliament, I have warned the members of Parliament that we should not assume that there is a divine destiny which will uh, ensure that India continues to flourish and prosper, however we mismanage our economy. 
great nations like the Soviet Union have perished. They have disappeared from the surface of the earth. If the Indian polity is not well managed, I think we ought to recognize that a similar danger can overtake us too. So we could collapse like Eastern European countries, the Soviet Union? I, I'm not saying that is on the card right away or that is inevitable, but if we continue to mismanage our economy, if we continue to divide our country on the basis of religion, caste and other sectarian issues, I think there is a great danger of that sort of thing happening. And it's a serious danger? It, it is a serious danger. Let me, let me push that thought a little further for a moment. Many people feel that although we have considerable achievements, nonetheless the sense of purpose we had 30 years ago we've lost. Today instead moral legitimacy is eroded, political authority is questioned. Do you think there's a danger that, in fact, we could end up fragmenting, that the nation status that we have could be in danger? Well, politics, unfortunately, has, to, has ceased in many ways to be a vehicle of purposeful, purposeful social change. It has become a ticket for power, power for the sake of power, not power as an instrument of doing something good for society. And that's, I feel, a great source of anxiety and danger to our, the future of our polity. So politics has become a vehicle for self-serving politicians rather than a means for change or a means for reform? Yes, I think that's very much true right, today. Is that one reason why you've chosen to consciously step into the arena and try and call a halt and change things? For example? Well, if I have opportunity, I do hope, I, I will, I think, be a small instrument of writing some new guidelines, the way the political processes should be conducted in our country. How much a part of the crisis, in a sense, that our country faces is also a result of another crisis, a crisis of leadership? To what extent have our leaders, historically, perhaps even now today, let us down? Leadership is the crux of the matter. Look at China. Uh, after the disastrous results of the Cultural Re uh, Revolution, here came that grand old man, Deng Xiaoping, at the age of 80, and he transformed the Chinese society beyond recognition. Leaders have to be leaders. They have to be pace setters, and not leaders who just uh, follow what is momentarily uh, in the popular mind, uh, look at the opinion polls every day, and adjust their thinking to that. I once said in Parliament about leadership, uh, quoting a couplet, Insan wo nahi hai jo hawa ke saath badale, insan to wo hi hai jo hawa ka rukh badale. And that's what our leaders in India today are patently failing well, to do. I, I think we need a leadership of that type. But Dr. Singh, then in that case, let me put this to you. The Deng Xiaoping that you admired, Mrs. Thatcher is another one of that example. Their sine qua non, their hallmark, were their conviction. It was their strength of belief in what they wanted to do that gave them courage. Do you therefore believe also that what we need today is conviction-based leadership? Without, I think, a measure of strong convictions, Indian leadership cannot deliver the goods. And I say it in all sincerity, because at the present time, the aspirations of our people are rather modest. And if we have a leadership which is not sincere, which is not you know, intent, uh, which uh, does not think uh, how we all should work to meet those aspirations, then I think tomorrow it will be too late. The gap between the aspirations and what is feasible politically, economically, socially will grow to a point that I think there will be a great danger of acute political instability in our country. So it's a question of now or never? Yes, that's very much the case. You're on record as saying that what we need in our country is reform with a big R in every sphere. But you added that the political mindset of our politicians doesn't recognize this. Where do they fall short? Well, most politicians in our country do not, I think, uh, adjust their thinking to the changing needs of our time. When I was a student at Nuffield College, Oxford, nearly uh, 40 years ago, uh, Mr. Uh, James, uh, I think, uh, one of the person who later on became Prime Minister, James Callaghan. James Callaghan. James Callaghan, when he became the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, he spent full one year at Nuffield College taking tutorials in economics. He said, 
I could not function as an effective shadow chancellor unless I had a deep understanding of modern economic analysis. Our politicians feel that whatever they learned in their childhood is adequate stock, uh, adequate stock for them to pronounce in everything in the world. I think there is contempt for knowledge. And Professor Rajkrishna once said, Indian politicians are knowledge-proof. And we live in a world where knowledge is power. So unless our politicians value knowledge, I think they cannot be the purposeful instrument of social change. You also once said that international ideas of what constitute good policy are totally at variance with what our politicians think. Now, I think I understand what you're saying, but could you exemplify that a bit? Well, I was talking in the context of the management of the economy. In the 50s, uh, the idea that the commanding heights of the economy must rest with the public sector, that if you nationalize an industry, you contribute to growth as well as to growth to social justice. If you restrict private investment, that also brings about socialism. If you raise tax rates, I think that helps, helps to reduce inequality. Now, in all these things, experience has shown that all these are short-term sentences. Then short-term sentences, as Alfred Marshall at Cambridge taught many, many years ago, all short sentences have their limitations in social matters. And therefore, one has to change one's thinking. The collapse of the Soviet Union is a telling example why a command economy simply broke down. But ideas associated with the command economy survive into the thinking of many of our politicians even till this day. The world has changed. And if we don't change our thinking in accordance with the changing needs of our time, then we have uh, a bagshaw, we have a railway timetable which is thoroughly out of date, and we will certainly miss the train. You are saying something more. You are also saying that our politicians are prisoners of failed truth. Well, that's in many ways true. In fact, you are also implying that we have a dinosaur mentality and we are in danger of the same fate the dinosaurs met. Well, there is a danger. I, I really believe it, I think. Yeah. Otherwise, how would you get a situation in this country that people can get votes on the basis of religion, people can still get votes and they take pride in seeking votes on the basis of the cost. Fifty years uh, after India uh, gave, gave itself a constitution which in its preamble talks about a classless society, and yet fifty years after we find Indian society so badly divided on the basis of religion and on the basis of caste. Dr. Singh, you're saying in fact something even more important. You're saying not only are we prisoners of failed truths, but we not only fail to realize that, but actually proud of the folly. Well, many politicians, I, 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 I try to say, I think, practice a very divisive politics for narrow sectarian reasons. It, is, it may be good politics for the moment, but it, is, it, it can be a source of disaster for our country to become a truly integrative and cohesive society. We need a type of politics which is inclusive rather than a type of politics which is exclusive. So today, sitting in front of me, you're calling for really rather far-reaching, I might even use the word dramatic reform and change in the way we operate. I am talking about change of the mindsets. I think institutional changes are necessary, but much more than institutional changes, we need a change of the mindsets of all those people who make the critical ruling decisions of our national life, be it politics, be it economics, be it, be it social engineering. So we need a big change in the mindset of thinking of our people at all levels and more so in the mindset of those who constitute uh, as our leaders. Dr. Mohan Singh, that's not just forthright. Many would say that that's a stinging indictment of the political system as it exists today. I have to ask you, this is so different to the perception we have of the Congress Party. Where do you fit in? Well, I came to politics by accident. I stayed with the Congress Party. And I do believe that uh, there is a ray of hope at Panchmari. Many of these things were discussed. And discussed. forgotten? Well, I would not say forgotten. I think there are momentary lapses. Politicians, before they can become statesmen, they want to be re-elected. And when electoral compulsions come, people do make compromises. But I have, I, I have faith in the power of ideas. As Victor Hugo once said, no power on earth can stop an idea whose time has come. Do you really believe that Sonia Gandhi is capable of representing the sort of dynamic, forward-thinking, far-reaching change that you're calling for? Well, Sonia Ji is a very dynamic person. I think whenever I have conversed with her, 
I think she is acutely conscious of the moral imperative, the moral foundation of our politics than many other politicians in this country at the top. I think she has in, in her many discussions with me, I think mentioned some of the problems which I have mentioned, how politics has ceased in our country to be a purposeful instrument of social change, how we are all bereft of all the, the moral... But can I interrupt and put this to you? Yes. Her appeal is emotional and passion-driven, yours is one of logic and reason. Where do the two of you meet? Well, I think I am a small entity in the Congress Party and Sonia Ji is the acknowledged leader of the Congress Party. She was elected uh, the uh, leader of our party at a time when our party was in deep crisis and that she sways the minds and hearts of our party was displayed as early, uh, as late as May 1999. So she provides the vote winning edge, you in a sense give the moral principle policy backbone. I am not the only one, I am only a small entity in this large organization called the Congress party. I am not saying that I have the monopoly of virtue or that I am the only one who know the truth. But you are the strongest, but clearest voice today calling for reform and change. The strongest voice pointing out that if we don't correct ourselves, we may lose the opportunity forever to do so. But there are many young people in our party who feel the same way. But they don't have the advantage and opportunity you do today of being a frontline leader. You are for them the first person in the line. Well, I'm not. I don't know what you're talking in the line. As I said, I, as of now, I'm only seeking election to the uh, membership of the Lok Sabha. All the rest is all in the realm of speculation. Absolutely. And I don't want to embarrass you by forcing you to make modest disclaimers about what will happen after the election. Let me put a hypothetical question instead. If you were to be head of the government after the election, do you think you'd be capable of pushing through the far-reaching reforms we're talking about in a constructive, in a cohesive proper, forceful way, or would it be piecemeal, would it be one step forward, one step back, would it be ad hoc? Well, let me say that I think the who will head the government, that's a hypothetical question. We'll cross that bridge when we reach that. But I sincerely believe that whosoever is the head of the government, I think, ought to, I think, implement a coherent program of action if our country is to move in the desired direction at a desired pace. I think we cannot uh, uh, have a, a system in which my esteemed friend Professor Piantar used to say, well, in this country we can have growth only through stealth, that you cannot do things the straight, the straight way. I think that time is over. We must do things the straight way, tell our people what are the options, what are the costs, uh, what are the benefits, and tell them why we consider on balance a particular course of action is best. So best you are also prepared to stand up and level with Indians, to tell them the truth as you see it, and if it's bitter, and it's bitter. I think without that we cannot carry forward the social and economic revolution, social and economic transformation that our country needs to realize the vision of the founding fathers of our republic. But there's a catch to it, because you also have to sell to them the essential message that we must learn to live within our means, that we have to tighten our belt today for a better tomorrow, and those sometimes are difficult things to say. Well, they are difficult, uh, and I often used to say in my budget, that money does not grow on trees, trees, and therefore I think there is such a thing as uh, the resource constraint. Uh, if there were no resource constraint and money could be simply printed for all purposes, every society would be a rich society today. The fact that in, um, most of the countries of the world are poor, it's because of the source shortage. So therefore, you are right that I think a political or economic leadership which tells the people uh, that there is no such thing as a resource constraint uh, is, I think, uh, a, a, this is a council of disaster. It's also a political leadership that's lying. It is lying, of course it is lying. But it's not just the challenge of telling the people the truth that you're going to face should you happen to be in that position. The other challenge, maybe even a bigger challenge, is the challenge of convincing the Congress party that the reform, that the change in mindset, that telling people the truth, even if it's bitter, even if it's at the cost of popularity, has to be done. Can you carry your party with you? Well, let me say, if you read our election manifesto, people have now compared the BJP, the so-called National Alliance, Democratic National Alliance manifesto, and our manifesto. I think most people will say that we have spelled out far more clearly our I, I, agenda than the BJP, uh, BJP has done. But no one Where takes manifesto but, seriously. Well, but but let me say that we have, I think, spelled out these things for the first time in great detail, sector-wise. Uh, where the, our system is really weak 
is about fis uh, bringing about fiscal correction. There, all political parties, I think, suffer from, I think, uh, uh, a lack of vision, a sense of purpose, and uh, a lack of adequate commitment. And, and if you're in the position to have to put that fiscal correction on the table, you will actually do it doggedly, even if it makes you unpopular. Well, uh, you look at my record, I think in 91, 92, uh, when this country was in desperate economic situation on the verge of collapse, I came with a budget which cut the fiscal deficit in a single, in fact, eight or nine months by 2% of GDP. We slashed subsidies all round. But what happened after Babri Masjid, things started well, to Well, after, after the Babri Masjid, the political, uh, political agenda uh, over uh, overtook the economic agenda. So Might that uh, not happen again? Well, I cannot say, I cannot say that uh, events will not uh, overtake. I think you cannot predict the social evolution. The process of social evolution is now never a linear, a linear process. I think exogenous events sometimes derail the process. It may have, it has happened before. But your personal determination to stay on course will always well, be there? Well, of course, I think, I think, uh, if, if I, if I have anything to do with, I think, managing our economy and our polity, I think we will try, I think, to erect, I think, uh, uh, the safeguards which would not derail, I think, uh, the inherent rhythm of the reform process that our country needs to realize uh, the vision Let me of put a couple of quick power. test questions to you. For yes. instance, if you were to be in charge of the next government, would you, for instance, carry forward fairly sizable and dramatic disinvestment so that the state is freed from doing things it shouldn't be doing and can concentrate on areas where it's needed, but at the moment... Well, let me say that we, we do want privatization, but not privatization all along the line. We believe that where public sector enterprises are running efficiently, there is no reason, for example, to privatize them. But public sector is no business to be in hotels or other low priority activities. So we will get, so the you'll get them out of bread, we you'll will, get them yes, out of hotels. We will get them out of these low priority activities. And save the, the resource is so safe, we will put them in education, in health, areas where we feel the state ought to be more actively involved. What about government expenditure? That's running away. Would you be able to curb it and drain it in? It cannot be curbed overnight. We need a perspective of three to four years to bring about an orderly adjustment of government expenditure. We'll, consider, we'll work to that, uh, that purpose. And you'll rigidly stick to that purpose? You yes. won't let yourself be blown off course by reaction or unpopularity? No, I think uh, we would make every effort to see that expenditure follows broadly agreed national priorities, that overall the expenditure pattern is conformity with national priorities and the level of expenditure is consistent with the limits of fiscal prudence. Will you slim the government down? We will do that. I think government is too bloated. I think areas where government has no business to be in. I think there are far too many ministries at the central government level. Now, we do not want to create overnight unnecessary unemployment in the public sector. But over a period of time, we must restructure our government. Okay, my last question, Dr. Singh. You've sketched out a very effective agenda for reform. You've committed yourself to the need for conviction for change. There are major question marks in people's minds whether your party will agree with it or whether they'll have the courage to persist with it. But let me put a personal question to you. Should you lose the Lok Sabha election, will you throw in the towel? or will you continue to fight in some other way for what you believe in? Well, uh, there is no question of throwing in the towel. I am in the fray, I am in politics, and uh, my, my politics does not end uh, with winning or losing the Lok Sabha election. I have come to politics in the belief that we must restore to politics its original purpose of being an a purposeful instrument of social change. And a moral instrument and as well. And a moral instrument. And ultimately, uh, our politics must be rooted, as Gandhiji used to say, in fundamental human values. You mentioned Gandhiji. If you happen to lose, will you continue as leader of the opposition in the Rajya Sabha or will you feel a moral compunction to step up? Well, I, I, I do feel I, I, I will have a moral compunction. So I think in that situation probably it would be uh, wise for me not to stay as the leader of the Rajya Sabha. And you opposition. will be, you will if, be doing... if we are in opposition, I think it would be proper for me not to, I think, remain as the leader of the Rajya Sabha Congress party. Even if your party insists, you will step down? Well, I think that's uh, my intention, that if I lose, for example, in the Lok Sabha, having gone to the people, not having earned their verdict, and then still staying in power 
as leader of the, I think, my party in the Rajya Sabha, I think that uh, probably will not be a desirable course of action. Dr. Manmohan Singh, many would hope that that doesn't come to pass. Obviously, that's not something for me to comment on. Thank you very much for talking so openly and so frankly to us. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, sir.